Bill, this is the last tape in the series. Before they all come back into the room, let me ask you something. Should we do some more? I mean, it's a little like Jack Green said to Bill Anderson as he was walking out of the last taping. Oh, we've just scratched the surface. You know, there are more songs, more stories, more careers we haven't been able to talk about yet. Marty Robbins, Jim Reeves, Webb Pierce. Stories yet untold about Minnie Pearl, Patsy Cline, Baron Young. And the list goes on and on. I'd love to have your comments. These country music pioneers won't be with us always. I would like to hear more of their stories. Please let me know. Right now, you're about to see TV the way it should be. No rehearsal, no script, mistakes and all. Remember the name Jimmy Caps. By the end of this tape, you'll know what I mean. Here's Bill. Skeeter Davis, 1963, was it? Was it 63? I'm going to go back so far. What year do you want to go to? <laughs> <laughs> well, Billy Hendry, the microphone back there. The, uh, the big year for, for the end of the world, when that was the... A big, big country hit, big crossover hit in the pop field. I shouldn't tell them she came to the house and listened to that and said, I don't know, you better bring out something else, should I? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I say, do the opposite. <laughs> oh, that is true. This song, I cut this song and recorded it, fell in love with the words, finally got to meet the writer when I did a concert in Carnegie Hall. She was a girl from Arkansas and uh, had married a doctor and lived up there. She was 44 years old when this song became number one, you know, on all the charts and even in so many other countries, which I traveled to in the past 15 years. But um, I fell in love with these words and I kept trying to get Chet to bring it out. And it stayed in the vault, the RCA vault, for about two years. And I would play the tape. It's the only record I ever made where I would play the tape. You know, I would like to, I would want to hear that song and I'd play the tape. And it is true, I mean, I was teasing you, but um, I was getting different artists that would come to the house that say, you know, help me get Chet to get this out, yeah. you know, and everything. And most of them said, well, you know, you've got some other things that are better. And finally I had to tell him, it's either this or I'm going back to Kentucky. I mean, you know, <laughs> and this was this late in my career. But I just believed in this song so much. I never dreamed it would be the number one record in the pop charts. I never believed it would have a life that's lasted this many years that's taken me all over the country. But I was glad I got to meet the writer. And um, she actually told me that she was 44 years old, that night in Carnegie Hall, but she wrote this when she was 14 years old, the words. Mm -hmm. She wrote it uh, for her feelings that, and for what her mother had said when her father passed. And uh, I, I was so happy to hear that because what, what I had done, I, these were the feelings I felt when I'd lost a couple of people that had passed. And it, but I, everybody else was thinking it was because me and Ralph broke up and I just let them think it. <laughs> and uh, it worked. You know? <laughs> and, uh, all righty. But now this is... Oh, now, I didn't rehearse this one, John. <laughs> Why does the sun go on shining? Sing it if you know it. Why does the sea rush to shore? Don't. Birds go on singing. Why do the stars glow above? I see y'all don't know this one. Don't they know it's the end of the world? It ended when I lost your love. I wake up in the morning. Why does my heart 
go on beating? Why do these eyes of mine cry? Big end and now, dog. I think after that we need a happy song. That is so beautiful. So, so touching. Can I just say something before I, I It's very special to me being here with, with all you people because I've, I've known y'all, known of you before I knew you, and, I, and I've loved you. And the first person that ever said, why don't you come to Nashville to me was Jimmy Dickens when I was 12 years old. Wow. And uh, could we talk, Dickens? Worked, uh, <laughs> worked with Dale when we were in California with Gene when I was a teenager. He was three and I was six. <laughs> and uh, to just be here among this group means an awful lot to me. But I got to thinking yesterday that we came up in a time. I don't care what they say about how successful country music is today, but we came up and we lived in the golden years of country music. I never, I never got to meet Hank Williams, but most of y'all did, a lot of you did. But knowing and working with Dickens and Kitty and Johnny and all of y'all that are here, but also Farron Young and Webb Pierce and Hank Snow and, and Roy Acuff and Minnie Pearl, there's never gonna be people like that again. And that's not to put the young ones that are in it down. It's like Carl Smith said, you know, somebody told him, said, well, y'all had more fun than we do. And he said, well, y'all don't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but but we, we, have, we have a camaraderie together. We've, we've lived together. We've worked together. We've traveled together. And they don't do that today. We were raised on Hank. And we were raised on uh, many. We were raised on these people Ernest we've been talking Pat. about. They were raised on the Eagles and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and that's the difference right there. Mm -hmm. Every house I've ever bought, the Beatles paid for. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we, but we really, honestly, and and it can never be repeated. We live in the greatest time that country music. Has mm -hmm. ever known, yeah. or will ever yeah. know, or will ever know. Well, there was an awful lot of closeness in those cars, more than just physical closeness. Yeah. I mean, you had to get along. Together. I mean, we were in dress. We'd go to a coliseum, and instead of everybody being on their own bus, we'd be in one dressing room. Gene yeah. Shepherd said, "Turn around, boys. I got to change clothes." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and that that brings you close together. Yeah. It's we're all very fortunate to have, to have been a part. And of those that. of you that had buses, <laughs> when there was people like me, you'd let me ride on your bus, and you know. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't pay no attention to what she says. <laughs> What'd you say, Sadie? I don't yeah, think the microphone picked you up. I came up in the air when I didn't ask them to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a oh. lot from you guys. <laughs> I, told you, I told you it was the golden age. <laughs> Bill? I, I was trying to get a happy song. I, I wanted to hear some Cajun music. I hadn't yeah. heard Jimmy yeah. sing yeah. Cajun yeah. songs yeah. since we've been here. Let's, let's change what we have. Let's I like this one. That's an awfully sad song. Yeah. <laughs> let's do something lively. That's awfully nice. Yeah, Dickie. We can do something we know. Alligator Man, uh, it's not a sing-along song, but down the line. 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 If I drove, you gotta go, me oh my oh. You gotta go, pull me oh down the bayou. Why ain't by the sweetest one, me oh my oh. Son of a gun, we'll have big fun on the bayou. Jump the line, cross his pipe, he live down low. On the night, I'm gonna see my Michelle, oh. Big guitar, filled through jar and the gear. Son of a gun, we'll have big fun on the bayou. Get down, fiddle. Look you along.
Then folks come and see my dozen Just in the sound of the hog wine, me oh my oh Son of a gun, we'll have big fun on the fire Timber, I cross this fire, feel it come home Cause tonight I'm gonna see my chef, me oh Pick it up, just a jar and the gale Son of a gun, we'll have big fun on the fire Great orchestra and a great uh, chorus. Merle Kilgore. Merle Kilgore, you're a great songwriter. You wrote one of the biggest hits in country music. You've written a lot of them. You wrote The Ring of Fire. You wrote More and More. But uh, Wolverton Mountain, boy, what a song. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wrote this song in 1959 because I was going to see my uncle Clifton Clowers, who lived on Wolverton Mountain. And Wolverton Mountain is in Arkansas between Clinton and Marlton, Arkansas, on the Route 65. And so uh, I thought to bring him a present. Now, he turned me on to country music. He played mandolin and fiddle. And uh, as a little kid, I said, well, I can't wait to go on Wolverton Mountain to hear Uncle Clifton pick. So when I got there, they were cutting sorghum molasses in the, in the field. And I said, uh, Uncle Clifton, I wrote your song as a present. So I sung the song to him. And uh, he was just, uh, just, it's just dry as he can be. He said, well, I think you wrote yourself a hit. I said, I just wrote it for you as a joke. And he said, you ought to think about that for a hit. So I, I had, uh, well, in fact, the next week I was on tour with George Jones. And uh, George and I shared a hotel room together. He said, sing me something new. I sung him a little bit of Wolverton to Mountain. He said, I hate mountain songs. <laughs> so Johnny Horton was one of my dearest friends. And of course, he had the Battle of New Orleans. He was the hottest thing going. And he said, Chief, you got a song for me to record? I can make you some money now. So I sung I song to Wolverton Mountain. He said, uh, you know something about mountain songs just don't get to me <laughs> from the plains of Texas, you know. Here comes so I gave up. I gave up on the song. I moved to Nashville, and Tillman, Franks, and Claude uh, came up to finish an album, the Comet Cheryl's album. And uh, he said, uh, Tillman said, Merle, have you got a song? We want to help you out on your move to Nashville. Have you got a song that, uh, that uh, you know, this folk music is really big now. You got a mountain song. I said, Do I have a mountain song? <laughs> they say, Don't go all over the mountain. If you're looking for a while, cost clips and flowers. Has a pretty young daughter. He's mighty handsome. With gun and knife, or tender lips, or tender lips, a sweet of thine honey, and Wolverton Mountain, protects her there. Oh, the bears and the birds, tell Clifton Clowers, if a stranger should wander there. Now, all my dreams, oh, Wolverton Mountain. I want a star for my wife. I take my chance. I'm gonna climb that mountain. Go flip the flowers. They take my life. Our tender lips are tender lips. Are sweeter than honey. And over the mountain. Protects her there. Oh, the bears and the birds. Tell Clifton Clowers if the spring should wander there. Now I'm going to climb that mountain. I'm going to get the one I love. I'm going up. I'm going up. All over to the mountain. It's below. Down here below. You know it just ain't right. For him to hide that daughter. I'm the one who loves her so. Set her tender lips, her tender lips, for sweet of an honey. And we're to mountains, protects her there. Oh, the bears and the 
bears in the burn. Tell Clifton Flowers if a stranger should wander there. Well, I don't care about Clifton Flowers. I'm going to climb up on that mountain. I'm going to get the one I love. I don't care about Clifton Flowers. I'm going to let you call King. Love those mountain songs. I love a mountain song. I got to tell you a little story about Merle Kilgore. We were working down in Florida one time on a, on a Johnny Cash tour, right? Yes. And and Kilgore was, we were in my car and you were riding back home with me. We're driving up, you know, whatever road we was coming up on. And Kilgore looked at the map and he said, We've got to go by the Stephen Foster Museum. <laughs> he thought he was Stephen Foster reincarnated. <laughs> well, they said I look like a stick. All oh, right, yeah. <laughs> okay. He said it's just a little ways off the road here. Well, it turned out to be a hundred miles <laughs> off the road. We went to the Stephen Foster Museum, and he bought everything that Stephen Foster. Old black, no. Uh, what what door chimes was it? Uh, uh, Swanee River. Swan Swanee, Swanee River. River. Yeah. He bought everything and, and brought it home. The car was full of Stephen Foster memorabilia. <laughs> and don't you remember on the way back I said, don't you think I look like Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> but he's dead, Merle. <laughs> Lady told me one time at a show, she said, you sound like Hank Williams. I said, but he's dead. She said, that's what I mean. <laughs> Jeannie Seeley, you have been uncharacteristically quiet. Yes. You're, you're usually the, the life of the party. Well, I thought you were going to tell the thing about the, the night you said you were hoarse. <laughs> you tell it. Yeah. Bill Anderson, right there by this cage, you know, backstage at the Grand Ole Opry one night, he came up real seriously to me and he said, I'm hoarse tonight. And I said, how can you tell? <laughs> And he's still my friend. He's still my friend. Uh, me and Mel Ellis did a show together one time. He came up to me after the show. He said, Hoss, I stuttered, and you whispered, and nobody heard a thing that was going on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another story about you. Um, How do we get they did a story? Well, <laughs> you turned on my microphone. <laughs> uh, they did a, a museum display on my life and, and career, and... I went in and they had all of my report cards from school laid out oh, there. No. I was scared, but I went up there and I did pretty good. I got great grades, but on every one of them it said she talks too much. <laughs> <laughs> but Bill told me that honestly, was it your third grade report card third the teacher grade. had written, Billy whispers too much. Oh. <laughs> and I think that's okay. They need to hear from us one way or another, don't you? I don't know if Fred Foster still feels this way or not, but. The man who opened a lot of doors for me is sitting right behind me, and I never did trust him behind me, but I was always afraid to look at him. <laughs> I've come a long way. <laughs> when you recorded this song for his record label, right? Yes, I did. He won produced this record for me, yeah. So if you'll hit me an A, and I'm going to do one verse and a tag, because I asked Bill not to ask me to sing after lunch. <laughs> Your hand is like a torch. You got that cat? The look in your eyes pulls me apart. Don't open the door to heaven if I Did you know you had a hit record 
when you heard that the first time after Jeannie recorded it? Well, you know, Hank Cochran, probably the greatest song plugger that ever lived, and certainly one of the best writers. He used to come out to me and he'd say, Cousin, I wrote one. And I was going to bring it to you, I swear. But I ran into Owen. And he's getting ready to do Brenda Lee. And he took it away from me. And by then, I'd say, you got to play it for me anyway. What if she doesn't do it? You know, of course, he never had seen Owen. <laughs> anyway, he called me one day, and he said, i got a girl singer you got to sign. I said, I'm not signing any girl singer. That's the way they all felt. And he said, I've got a song, though, that goes with her. Well, that made it a little more interesting. So they came out, and Jeannie sat down in the floor in my office, and before 16 bars had gone by, I had chill bumps you could, you know, hop on. So, oh, so I said, well, I'll do that. We'll assign her. So <laughs> we get to the session, and we we'll have this rhythm section. So Hank looks at me, and he says, where are the strings, cousin? I said, strings? There are not going to be any strings on this. Why? I said, well, it's an intimate song. And it should all be her, because she's so great. Well, I know she's great, but she might be greater with strings. And I said, no. <laughs> well, we did the session. Dottie West came in when we were doing it. She started crying in the middle of the thing. And she said, can you produce me like that? I said, no, because first of all, Chet won't let me. And secondly, <laughs> I don't really have time. She knew too much about that. And she <laughs> said, uh, well, I think that's one of the greatest things I've ever heard. I said, well, Hank wanted strings on it. She said, you can't pay any attention to him. He doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great record, and I, you don't believe the mail and calls I got from fans about that record. You were the first producer in Nashville to cut a record on Dolly Parton, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh -huh. No. No. <laughs> That's what I said. You weren't the first. <laughs> so, so I'm not, uh, but I think Buddy Killen did a, I think Buddy Killen, I believe Buddy Killen did a split session on her but it never got placed. Okay, let me rephrase that. You did the first Dolly Parton record that got released right. in Nashville. Okay. Uh, the way that happened was Billy Graves, who was one of the country lads on the old Jimmy Dean show, and when that went north to New York and left all the boys behind, I signed Billy Grammer. Now, you got to travel on. That was our first record. Then I signed Billy Graves, and Dick Flood, his singing partner, and I wrote a song called The Shag, and Billy did it. It was a hit, so he had to go on the road. He came back off of one tour, and he said, that's it. I can't do this. It's too hard. I don't want to ever be a star. <laughs> and so he got a job at Capitol Records in the A&R department. I believe Marvin Hughes was the head of A&R here then. And, of course, Ken Nelson out on the coast was the head of the whole thing. And Billy called me one day, and he said, I've, I've got to ask you if you'll do me a favor. And I said, well, sure. What is it? He said, there's a girl singer. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, I think she's fantastic, and they, they've turned her down. Ken Nelson said she was terrible. Would you listen to her? I said, sure. So Dolly and Bill Owens came out the next morning, and I said, do you write? And she said, yes. And I said, sing me four songs you've written. Meaning that anybody might look up and write one, but you're sure never going to look up and write four, you know. <laughs> So she sang me four songs, and I said, uh, if you'll come back in the morning, I'll have your contract ready for Monument and your songwriting contract with Combine Music Group. She said, is that all there is to it? I said, that's all. Why are you doing this? She said, everybody in the world has turned me down. I said, well, that's their problem, not mine. And uh, <laughs> I said, I just want to ask you one question, though, before we agree to the terms here. You know you are so different that there'll be about as many people initially not like you as do like you. Can you live with that? She said, I don't care who doesn't like me as long as somebody likes me because I am going to be a star. I said, be here at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> what a great story. I Tell me. Tell story. Tell it. Yeah, all right. Let me have your microphone, Gene. <laughs> yeah, she's going to give it. You think I'm crazy? <laughs> she, she wasn't going to give me the mic for this one. I was head of Liberty Records Country Department in California, and Jeannie was a secretary in our office out there. And she longed to be a country singer. 
Well, I had just signed Willie Nelson to his first contract, and I was recording Bob Wills and had some hits, so Jeannie must have thought I knew what I was doing. <laughs> so she got me aside and said, I'm thinking about going down to Nashville. Do you have any advice for me? I said, I sure do. I said, sit down here, and I'll tell you. I said, when you first get to Nashville, people will judge you for a long time by your first impression. I said, now, when you go there, you go there with a serious mind about being a singer, and don't get around that Hank Cochran in that bunch <laughs> and, and start running on the boat and then staying up late at night and running around all over that place and give people the wrong idea. She said, I'll remember everything you said, Joe. So she came down to Nashville and married Hank Cochran within a few weeks. <laughs> Yeah, but what Joe did tell you is every time he went to Nashville, he went out on the boat with Hank Cochran. Yeah. <laughs> I was already married. <laughs> That's the part I missed. <laughs> so was Hank. <laughs> Del Reeves, you've been playing around a little bit with your uh, doodle doo dee doo here. Doodle -doo. But I, I think we need to get uh, more than just a little tiny taste of it. Yeah, let's... Uh... <laughs> Uh, hold on, we wrote this thing about a real, real story about his wife worked at the Bell Telephone Company, and he'd go down there to pick her up in the afternoons. And the song tells the rest of the story of what he thought about him, or, you know. But look, and hey, boys, all right. I do, 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 Well, you know how I got that was uh, I was trying to learn to play the violin a long time ago. And you'd get uh, the notes in your head, and you could do <laughs> So that's where it all come from, just to try to learn to play the violin. You want to record that, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'd written a, in the first of all, 1964 was Girl on the Billboard didn't come by until uh, 65, with Hubert Long and Hank Mills, as you, as you know well. And uh, I was doing a tour with Johnny Cash in uh, uh, 64, and we, I, we had written a song with Ellen called Nobody From Nowhere. And uh, if it ever fit anybody in the world at that time, it fit John R. Cash, because he didn't know where he was at. He didn't care where he was at. And at times, you couldn't even find where he was at. But I sing him. After the show that night, we finally found him in Miami. And he went on. I, matter of fact, I went on doing a couple of his songs. Luther got me out there while they tried to find him. And, boy, that was a terrible deal, uh, you know. But I went on. But after he got on and the show got on and he, he got through, I his back are popping beers in the, in the dress room. And uh, my wife just had a new hairdo. Oh, she was ducking, you know. And I sang him the song. 
And uh, uh, when I got to seeing nobody from nowhere, <coughs> he said, Hoss, I don't think I like that damn song. <laughs> but if I was you, though, I'd use it. Do, 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 whatever you're doing there. I'll put that on record if I was you. Well, lo and behold, when girl, I had that on that on that uh, demo that I uh, sang for John, and then I put it to I found girl on a billboard, and I never forgot what got John. I never forgot what he said. And now I, I I put it to it, and it it worked. And now every time I see John, he always says to me, <coughs> "Hello, our do do." <laughs> You got a story, Carolyn? <laughs> well, let me turn around and watch you tell it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you. I've got a couple of stories. Go ahead. Oh, good. I'll bet you you didn't know this one, John. After Jan Howard decided to leave the road, I almost became Bill Anderson's girl singer. Is that right? Didn't I? You sure did. But I didn't make the grade. Uh, I'll tell you who did, though, and she's so good, and she fit his show just perfectly, and that's Mary Lou Turner. Yeah. And y'all had some hits together, but I sang on those hits. You sure did. Ellie uh, e. White and I did. You sang on those. You, used to, you and Ellie used to sing on a lot of Conway Twitty's records, yes. too. Yes. Uh, well, that's a strange, that's the other story I was going to tell you, because uh, I worked in the studio with, with him for 10 years, recording Linda on my mind, and this time I've heard her more than... She Loves Me, and, and on and on and on, all, all during that whole everything. segment. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, Tommy knows. You, you know, Ellie White and I was on uh, ABC Network in 1952 as a trio. Where? The Drifters Trio. It's Ellie where? played fiddle and I played guitar. Yeah, a trio. The guy the named <laughs> Harry Whittemore was singing oh. lead. Yeah, and, uh, but we got on the, the talent patrol. That's incredible. In 1952. Yeah. You brought something? You know, there was a time in our business when they called our music country and western. Yeah. There was a time when they called it hillbilly, too, and I remember that very well. Yeah. Yeah. Were you insulted when they called it hillbilly yeah. music? No. Sort of. No. Well, no. Uh, no. Gene says no. no. Well, I did an album called Skitter. I was in New York. A lot, a lot of guys wanted to change over to country music, all these pop sounding guys, but none of them wanted to be known as a hillbilly, so if we, if, you know, I didn't that would have stopped. Uh, a lot of these guys from trying to sing country music country. couldn't sing. Because they didn't want to be known as a hillbilly. <laughs> I just wanted to be known, didn't you? <laughs> I was getting to the fact that Billy Walker has recorded uh, a lot of great Western songs. Yeah. Songs with Western yeah. flavors yeah. to them. Well, you know, my old granddad uh, was an absolutely West Texas cowboy. Uh, one of my granddads. And in fact, he rode the Old Chisholm Trail. And he used to tell me a lot of stories about uh, the West and... I got fascinated uh, not only by uh, all the stories that he told, but, you know, the early cowboy singer sang about the old Chisholm Trail and all the gunfighter ballads and things like this. And uh, I guess me and Marty both were vaccinated by Sons of the Pioneers, Neil. And uh, we enjoyed Gene Autry and uh, Roy Rogers. And uh, all these songs uh, kept coming up from my youth. And when I heard... Uh, Across the Brazos at Waco, I uh, I said, boy, I've got to I've got to record that song. It's a great song. Would you sing it for us? I'd be delighted to. Oh, the Chisholm Trail, it was midnight. Carmelo was strong in his mind because of the light. Had chosen Carmela had left him behind. Too long he'd been El Bandito. Carmela had left him alone. But today someone brought a message. She'd been seen in old San Antonio. Cross the Brazos in Waco. Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. It'd wake up. I'd say when I reach San Antonio. He glanced back over his shoulder. The posse was nowhere in sight. It sent for Carmela to meet him on the banks of the Brazos tonight. She was waiting and he kept the promise. 
It made such a long time ago As he brought the guns that she hated And the money brazos below Cross the brazos in Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the brazos in Waco I say when I reach San Antonio With gunfire, he knew that at last he'd been found. As the ranger's badge shone brightly, El Bandido on the ground. Carmela knew he was dying, that all of her dreams were in vain. As she kissed his lips for the last time, she heard him whisper again. Cross the Brazos and Waco, ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and Waco, I'm safe when I reach San Antonio. Oh, I'm safe when. Had some pretty good background singers there with yeah, the and Carol Lee. <laughs> Great choir. But Bill, you know, we were we were talking a little earlier about all the the great varieties of country music. You've got country music, got you got western music, and you got a, a lot of different styles of music in the country music business. One thing that we really enjoyed in the '60s was uh, some of those great songs that you did where you half sang and half whispered on yeah and uh don't y'all think that we ought to hear one of those great songs so. yeah. 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 maybe maybe still or something like that. only if i can get everybody in here bill i've got to tell this on you before you go any further <laughs> <laughs> here's something right they, they, was, they was talking about being disc jockey i was probably about the first person that bill interviewed yes <laughs> and he talked to me for 30 minutes, and I looked at him, I thought, this child is in over his head. <laughs> <laughs> he don't know how to get out of it. <laughs> Ernest Tubb was on the show, a lot of people. So finally, I just said, Bill, I think I've talked, I've, I think I've uh, talked to you long enough. I need to turn you loose so you can go talk to somebody else. That's how we got out of it. <laughs> well, I was having so much fun. I was just in awe of you. I just had so many questions. I wanted answers to all of them. But you, you were very nice. You ain't going to sing still, are you? Yeah, you go help me. <laughs> no, I'm not going to sing still. I've never liked that song. <laughs> I've never liked it, and I've never liked you because of it. <laughs> go ahead, Bill. Well, what, what are you trying to say, John? What a nice. 1963, I wrote a song, and it did pretty good, and I thought, you know what, this may be my one chance for the song of the year. Still. You know what the song of the year was in 1963? Still. Still. <laughs> and I still ain't had a song of the year. You're still well, trying. I'll probably never have another one. Uh, no, 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 will, will, will everybody in here sing yes, well, yeah, Y'all yeah. know the part. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Right. What? Jump in there. I know you know it because you did a you did a parody to it. Yeah, we may get to that later. Yeah. You want to go on the road? Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I've done that. 
I've lost count of the hours. And I've lost track of the days. Billy says sing to one person, right? In fact, I've lost just about everything since you went away. Everything that is except the memories you left me. And that's one thing that no one can mar. I don't know who you're with. I don't even know where you've gone. My only hope is that someday you might hear this song. And you'll know that I wrote it especially for you. And I love you wherever you are. crazy and you're right and maybe I am but I'll carry this torch just as long as I can for someday you might just decide to come home and I want you to know I'm still here to you still <laughs> though you took my car still I know you won't get far you'll be standing still still when a mile has passed you'll run out of gas and you'll be sitting I'm just trying to sing to you. I'm doing the narration. I've lost count of the time and I've lost track of the hours. You know why, honey? I lost my damn wife. <laughs> Part about the flame burning hotter and hotter. Oh, the flame, yeah, it's getting hotter and hotter. You may decide to come home sometime. I don't think so. And you might just find that I made an ash out of myself. <laughs> You've been in that fireplace too long. Did <laughs> I not sing to you? All right, one, one, one more little chorus. Here we go. I wasn't going to do it, but you had so much fun when you got to me to laugh. This is a lot of fun. You guys are my friends and my heroes, and uh, and it's wonderful to be here. I'm not going to interview Shepherd, but I'm going to try to get her to sing. Can, yeah. can we get a song yeah, out of Gene yeah, Shepherd? Yeah, I don't yeah, think we have one. Yeah. You, know, you know what I'm going to say? I have no idea. I, I, no, I often say this, and I truly mean it. I think Bill Anderson is probably one of the greatest songwriters that's ever been in country music, without a doubt. And that comes from the heart. You are Stephen Foster. <laughs> You don't look like him, but you are. <laughs> <laughs> the world is Stephen Foster. I'm going to make all the girls sing on this. Yeah, we need a mom back. 
back up, Mike. Now, get, get us a good back up, Mike. Here. Jim, y'all go ahead and kick it off. Are you ready? Here we go. Y'all hang on. This don't cost nothing extra. Yeah, they got it. Jimmy Caps, are you there? Yes. Okay, let's hear from you. <laughs> what are we doing? Slipping away, I think. Monday's promise is Tuesday's lie. Saturday's party is Sunday's fight. Something's wrong with you and I. Love's gone wrong, but used to be right. And I can feel it slipping away. Slowly, slowly. Performance from a from a brand new duet act over here, Dickie Lee and Johnny Wright. Now, uh -oh. uh, Johnny, explain explain what this this song is all about. Now. This song was written by Jack Pangle and myself. We had this on RCA. It was the number one record for us back in 1951. Before Dickie Lee was born. Before Dickie Lee, he was coming along. But he, Dickie came along about uh, two or three years later and recorded. He had a number one record on it. Then after Dickie Lee cut it. The Desert Road group out of California recorded. Uh, Chris Hillman and that group, they had a num number one record on it. So we're going to show you how to make a number fourth on it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get every, we're going to have everybody here to sing on the course. And it's uh, the, the band's going to take it off over there in the Calypso Don't style. Don't on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, just going to use eyes. I was just okay. They're gonna take it off the clip so side. We'll do the chorus. I'll do a verse back to the chorus. They're gonna play it out, and then he'll do a, a verse and out for the chorus. She'd go ashes of love as cold as ice yeah. in the key of F, <laughs> like Frank. Give us that clip so beat. Ashes of love. Cold as ice, you make death, and I pay the price. Our love is gone, there's no doubt. And she's the love, the flame burned out. 
the love light that gleams in your eyes has gone out to my surprise. We said goodbye, and my heart bled. I can't revive your love is dead. Ashes of love, cold as ice. You may dead, I pay the price. I love is gone, there's no doubt. Ashes of love, the flame burns out. Hey, she burns out. talked about Bill Monroe, one of the true pioneers, not only in the Country Music Hall of Fame, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, I guess you got a lot of great memories of your years with Bill Monroe, don't you? Well, I only worked with him about uh, one year in uh, 1949. I came here to the opera and worked with him. But it was a very educational and pleasant year, and I enjoyed it very much. Of course, we worked all through the years up to his death, uh, but he became incapacitated and couldn't work any longer. But with a lot of the festivals, so we saw a lot of each other on the bluegrass festivals. And toward the end of the evening, we'd usually have a little yang bang, so to speak, and everybody would be saying, you know. So, but uh, I enjoyed his camaraderie. He was a pioneer in his own way, I'll tell you that. Do you consider yourself country or bluegrass? Well, I just do not have any tag put on it. I do some of both. <laughs> but, uh, you do it well. Just say, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else here ever work with Bill Monroe? I mean, other yeah, than at the Opry? You know, well, get rid of this too. <laughs> Turn the mic around there, Mac. Let him know. Yeah. There we go. I'm going to tell you a funny one about Bill. Now, this, this is really the truth. I was at one of the rope meetings, and uh, Bill was sitting at the table with us. And uh, somebody brought up a, a promoter's name down in Florida, and Bill said, I don't like that man. <laughs> I never did like that man. He said, he, he done something to me one time, said, I don't remember what it was, but I never did forgive him. <laughs> we all lived in a trailer park over on Dickerson Road. Rainbow. A long time ago. Rainbow. Rainbow. <laughs> no, it was uh, Dixon. yeah, Dixon. That's Rainbow. Rainbow. That's right. Wow. Don't Dickerson Road and Bill had horses back then. He invited me to ride with him one day and I rode. Of course I was drinking back them days. <laughs> and, and we rode all day long, never stopped riding, and he never said a word all the way till we get back to the trailer camp. He got said, Had a good time, boy. <laughs> he was a man of few words, Jimmy. Uh, I need to grow a mic. Y'all go on to a mic. Oh, thank you. I had the pleasure uh, the year after I moved from Louisiana here to the Grand Ole Opry of doing a tent tour all through Mississippi until the tent uh, tornado came and blew the tent away. But anyhow, we had a great, it was a great experience to me. Because I'd been working those knife and gun clubs in Louisiana, and uh, <laughs> and a few shows, and uh, yeah, skull arches, and and then we did this tent show, and uh, the Everlys uh, <laughs> were on the tour, and on the tour, the Everlys had Bye Bye Love to be released, and I had a fallen star to come out, and as at the time Jim Reeves, his four walls came out. And I'll never forget those times because we had a, it was a great experience working with Bill. Later, Bill recorded two of my songs, 
But we traveled in this um, limo, and I rode, and Rufus and I rode with uh, Bill, and we had the back seat with the four Pekingese dogs. Two, two Pekingese dogs. <laughs> and you talk about dangerous, too. You have to be careful where you, you sit down, because them dogs <laughs> take a chunk out of you. It's a great experience. They eat you alive. Yeah, they yeah. I got bit several times. <laughs> we handed them uh, crawfish every once in a while to keep them tamed. <laughs> but we got by. God. It was a great experience. Uh, you know, right after coming to the Grand Ole Opry to tour with Bill Monroe and to know what it was like and, uh, and the tent shows and everything. And as I said, he recorded two of my songs later. So I've got great memories of Bill Monroe, and most of us do. Uh, Bill, I, I spent a little time around Mr. Monroe. He looked like my father, and I told him that first time I ever met him. He must be a good-looking man. Yeah, he's, yes, sir. He's <laughs> but Matt and Scruggs, who worked with him with Mac just before or after Mac worked with him, I guess everybody in the bluegrass business has one time worked with Bill. Oh, yeah. Paul Warren, for instance. And, and anyway, Flatten Scruggs and Bill with the group were going up someplace in Kentucky to play. And Bill said, pull up this next house up here on the right and stop over, stop and be there a minute. So they stopped and, and Bill got out and he walked across a, a bridge, walking bridge, across this little house and he knocked on the door. And this big tall fella came out and they went to Fist City right there on the porch, <laughs> just knocking each other around. Then all of a sudden he turned around and came and got back in the car and they went on. It was his brother, Charlie. <laughs> Something would bother him on his mind, you know, and he, he'd get all upset about that. But he's talking about flattening the scrubs and one more. I asked Earl one time, and you know how sweet Earl is, just very quiet. I said, Earl, in all seriousness, I said, Earl, which hand is, is the most important when you're playing the banjo? He thought a minute, he said, well, you pretty much have to have both of them. <laughs> Bill, do you know uh, how many bluegrass players it takes to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> how many, Joe? It takes seven. One to screw it in and six to say Earl Scruggs didn't do it that way. <laughs> Bill, I worked a couple times with uh, Bill when Bessie was there. And those little Pekingese dogs would eat you alive. As long as you was looking at them, they was okay. But you turn around to leave the room, and man, they would attack you. And I told Bessie, I said, Bessie, the next time one of them boogers gets me, it's, they're, they're going to pick them up off the wall. Because they were mean. And speaking of Bill, he did travel with his horse. One time they left Nashville, and he had the horse in the trailer. And they was driving about 40, 50 miles down, and they heard this cloppity clop, and they couldn't figure out what it was. Well, the bottom had come out of the trailer, and that horse was running, and he run for 40 miles trying to keep up with it. Bill Monroe, when I had open heart surgery, Bill Monroe was there. He came, and he uh, stayed with me until they took me down the hall, and then he walked as far as they let him go. And finally, they said, Mr. Monroe, you can't go any further. And he, now I don't remember this because I was out, but they told me about it. He took my hand and he opened it up and he put a quarter in there. <laughs> yeah. And he closed my hand up and he said, now you bring that back to me, boy. <laughs> and then he stayed there and he took my kids to lunch. And my daughter told me, he said, he didn't say nothing. He just took us to lunch and sat there with us the whole time. And he would not leave that hospital till he knew I was all right. Well, I was just going to say, and that shows how he was, but... What I'm amazed at as we listen to these stories and share these stories and just to see God's grace and goodness just protecting everybody yeah. and bringing everybody on these journeys. And Bill sang for my 50th birthday and my 60th birthday. But on my 50th, I asked him, and the girls know this because we shared this recently mm -hmm. when we did a show together, but uh, he had named the little horse Skeeter. And on my 50th birthday, uh, I, I invited him to the church that I was attending, which also is the church Jeannie C. was going to that we talked about. And uh, he came, and he actually really committed his life uh, back to Christ. And he had just been such a, uh, a Christian that I think it was so great. And, um, and when he left, and when I went to his um, uh, funeral at the uh, Opry House, and then also at, the, at Rosine, I slipped a quarter in his pocket, because they did take the quarters out of the casket, I think, mm -hmm. to give the children. But I left one in his pocket, John. But I think that's what's so amazing, just to hear all these stories and and just to see how God has been so protective and so gracious to everybody that all these journeys, and I just have to throw that in right now. I mean, they may pitch it out, but i got to throw it in there right now. <laughs> <laughs>
we were sitting in church one day, sitting in church, and Bill always sat right behind me. And he leaned up, he said, have you got chains for a hundred? I said, no, sir, I sure don't. He got up and went up to the altar. And when they brought the plates up there, he put the hundred dollar bill in and took change out. <laughs> You know, the preacher told me later, he said, he said, that really touched me. He said, there's a lot of people that would have that $100 bill and say, well, I can't put a $100 bill in there, and I can't get changed, so I just won't put anything in. But he went up and I'll he never got changed. <laughs> Bill, Bill I, got, I got one more thing about Bill Monroe. I got to tell this. A guy sent me a song. This is true. And it was called, I don't want a cabin in the valley, I just want a shack up in the hills. <laughs> I took it to Acuff and I said, Ake, I've got a hit song for you. And I told him the title, well, Acuff thought it was the funniest thing he ever heard. <laughs> so I went next door and told Bill Monroe. I said, Mom, got a hit song. Mm -hmm. I don't want a cabin in the valley, I just want a shack up in the hills. He said, you making fun of people born and raised in cabins? I said, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm going raise Kevin. You making fun of people living Kevin? I said, No, Bill, it's a joke. <laughs> all of his guys, all his guys, that, and he quit speaking to me. If Bill said Heidi, Heidi, he really liked it. He quit speaking to me for months, but he went to the hospital when he had heart surgery, and I waited till he got out of intensive care, and I sent him a little vine, and I said, I don't care if you are mad at me, you old poot. I still love you. <laughs> so when he come back. It was Heidi Heidi again. <laughs> he mellowed a lot in his yes. later years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think the incident uh, about him getting yeah. out and, and fighting with Charlie, I, I don't think in later years that Bill, when he died, was the most uh, celebrated bluegrass musician in the world. Oh, yeah. yeah. He uh, yeah. got big money for going out and doing his dates. Let me tell you about one of his last show dates. <clears throat> we had a meeting of the Justin Tubb Fan Club in the back room of a Quincy Steakhouse over in Madison. Place was full. I was invited to come out and tell Justin Tubb stories, which I can do for two, three hours. <laughs> and I looked up and in walked Bill Monroe and John Hartford. And they said, we've come to entertain at this boy's birthday, and they got up and sung for an hour. And Bill turned around and said, if you ever need me, I'll be back. And they walked out. <laughs> He, he used to come in church and bring the whole band and and uh, and get up and he'd just walk into church and he'd tell the preacher, say, I brought the boys and, and our music. And the preacher said, well, do you mind if I give my sermon first? He'll say, no, no, sir. <laughs> and when he'd get through, Bill, get up there with the band, they'd do an hour. Wow. Hey, you know who we haven't heard from as far as the song goes? Bill Carlisle's been sitting here with us throughout and having fun. I think you ought to do a song. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll all join in. And when we hit the courses, I want you all to be so loud that you can't hear me. Cause I'm hoarse. <laughs> a little bit hoarse, yeah. How about hitting us a G? Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for our fathers. Good for our fathers. It was good for our fathers. And it's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Old time religion. Old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for Paul and Silas. Good for Paul and Silas. Good for silence, and it's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. I 
I never did hear. <laughs> that was good. Shep, I think you've got an old gospel song that you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. That's I'll another one we can all join in on. Or? Sure, bet. All right. Yes. Uh, in, your, in your hymnals. Yes. <laughs> It's number four in your hymnals. If you have hymnals. Yes, they Faster. I want to get it over with. Come on. I guess I do. Just a closer walk with me. Uh, we really haven't mentioned and we haven't thanked and that's these guys that are making the music Mike Johnson, Les Singer, Glenn Duncan, Dirk Good. Johnson, Jimmy Caps, Randy Hardison and David Smith all these guys Good. in the band they've done a super job we thank y'all thank yes sir we need a microphone there's one person I want to mention that's meant a lot to me and and done a lot for my, my uh, career, and that's Tillman Franks, yep. down yes, in indeed. Freeport, Louisiana. Yeah, he was Johnny he won the best. Manager. Was he your manager at one yeah, time? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Billy Walker was mine, too. Mm -hmm. Was he your manager? Houston. Yeah. David Houston, yeah. David Houston, yeah. Houston. yeah. yeah. He's got a lot of great careers. I tell you what, he was a good manager. I remember walking up to Johnny Horton one time. Now, this is a manager doing his job. I said, hey, Johnny, how you doing? Tillman said, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all. I think the tape is out, and uh, this has been a marvelous experience. Thanks to everybody for the wonderful job that they did. Just absolutely is it over? I'll never forget this experience.
If you've ever had a dream come true, then you know exactly how I feel right now. I dreamed of two days with some of the pioneers of country music. Two days to sing their signature songs. Two days to tell stories on each other. Two days to laugh together. Two days to remember. Two days to reminisce about the golden days of country music. The days when your favorite stars loaded into station wagons to make that trek across the country to play for you, their fans. Sometimes they'd be at the high school gym, sometimes at the National Guard Armory or the fairground, but they would always come and they would always entertain. Today, you've seen a part of that dream. This is one of a four volume set. I hope you've had the opportunity to see them all. I also would love to hear your comments. My address is on the back of the video box. But if you'll grab something to write with, I'll give it to you while we're wrapping this up. It's Larry Black, The Caleb Group, Post Office Box 210483, Nashville, Tennessee, 37221. Let me know if you think we should do some more of these. Let me know if you enjoyed these pioneers of country music. And if, for chance, this is your first opportunity to see one of this four-volume set of Country's Family Reunion, Contact me at the address given earlier so I can let you know how to get all four volumes. Thanks for joining us. I hope you've had as much fun watching as we've had doing it. God bless you.